Hi, my name is Ryan Barbeau. I'm a licensed psychologist at the University of Florida Counseling and Wellness Center. And today I will be speaking with you about test anxiety. During this presentation, I want to explain um, various sources of test anxiety and then also coping strategies, what you can do to combat test anxiety and perform and feel better on tests. All right, I want you to imagine for a second that you're an, uh, an early human who lived you know, many, many years ago, and all of a sudden you come across a snake. How do you feel? If we look at this from an evolutionary perspective, um, most early humans uh, that were able to successfully survive and pass on their genes would likely have um, a very strong emotional reaction to seeing um, an animal like a snake that could pose harm to them. And uh, since this is uh, what our ancestors passed along to us, when we experience things that are threatening, we feel these same really strong emotional reactions. And they're adaptive in the sense that if there's an animal that we need to run away from or something we need to fight um, in order to ensure our survival, that will be very helpful for us to have these strong emotional reactions. But in modern days, um, there's other things that also can be very threatening that don't necessarily require the same types of emotional responses. For example, if you're taking a high stakes test that's causing you test anxiety, um, the kind of strong emotional reaction that would help you survive an encounter with a snake may not necessarily be adaptive in that test taking context. Now imagine you're taking a very important exam. How do you feel? You may feel a lot of test anxiety. And this is essentially a lot of energy. If the task was to, you know, uh, you know, take the run away from the exam or fight the exam, then you'd be in potentially a good physiological uh, space to be able to perform well. But that's not the way exams work, right? You need to be a little bit more relaxed than that, or potentially a lot more relaxed than that, in order to retrieve the information that you've studied and learned and be able to um, kind of perform that cognitive task of retrieving and providing the correct answer. So the key is to get in the optimal range of physiological arousal in order to perform well on challenging cognitive ta tasks like exams. In fact, research has been done to determine the optimal level of physical arousal for various um, performances in different activities. And you'll, as you'll see in the graph here, that, uh, that it's what's called a curvilinear relationship, meaning that if you don't have a lot of energy, physiological arousal, emotion, you won't perform very well on a task. Also though, if you have too much physiological arousal, like, for example, if you have so much anxiety that you're on the verge of a panic attack, you won't perform well either. You'll perform at your optimal when you're somewhere here in the middle. And for easier tasks, tasks that are less cognitively demanding, you'll um, be able to get a, away with a little bit more physiological uh, arousal before your performance suffers. But for more challenging cognitive tasks, tasks like taking a test, it, you notice it's a little bit uh, a little bit less. So the key is to get your physiological arousal level in the optimal range here to maximize your performance. But how do we do that? How do we control our bodily reactions and keep ourselves in that optimal range? Well, a key is to look at the thought, our thought processes. And I have a, a sort of analogy here. Imagine if I gave you a pair of blue tinted sunglasses and asked you to look at a lemon. What color is the lemon? Now, most people will say green, and indeed it will look green to you. But if I ask you again, what color is the lemon? You'll see that the color of the lemon is actually yellow. It just appears to you to be green because you have these blue tinted sunglasses on. And that, I think, is a good um, sort of analogy or metaphor for the idea that things, uh, how we kind of, uh, uh, the, the 
the filter through which we see things and label things changes what it what it uh, seems to be to us. Um, and I think that's really important to consider when you look at something like test anxiety, which I'll explain more about in a moment. There's also some interesting research about cognitive, the importance of cognitive labels that I'd like to share with you. So in this research study, they had participants, um, they randomly assigned participants into two different groups. And one group walked across a shaky bridge and the other group just walked, walked across the ground like normal. And after doing this, there was someone who was in on the study who presented a pamphlet to each group. And then another person from the study came and asked the person if they found the person who gave them the pamphlet attractive or not. And guess what happened? The group who walked across the shaky bridge mistakenly um, uh, thought that they were more attracted to the person who gave the pamphlet than the other group. So essentially walking across the shaky bridge had caused a physiological reaction in them that they had kind of misinterpreted as the sort of butterfly type of feeling you might get in your stomach if you meet someone that you find attractive. So I think this relates a lot to the idea about test anxiety is that we will have you know, certain physiological reactions before taking an important test. But if we label that as a threat versus a challenge, it can have a lot to do with sort of then what flows from that in terms of our thoughts, in terms of other physiological reactions. One can lead to sort of a panic attack um, type of reaction that obviously would be detrimental in terms of one's performance, whereas the other viewing the test as a challenge instead of a threat can be um, you know, uh, a lot more helpful and can help kind of channel and harness that energy into a productive test taking experience. When I teach about this concept, I also share an example from um, my personal life that I think is sort of interesting. Um, I say it kind of as a joke because actually what you'll see in this picture here is me and my partner and that's at Machu Picchu. And before I asked her to marry me, we had hiked the mountain and looked at the, um, the ruins there in, in, in Machu Picchu. And like I said, she had actually planned the, the event herself. But I always say that um, you know, it, it, it didn't hurt that we had uh, done this kind of physical exercise and climbed the mountain uh, when, when I asked her to marry me, that I think, you know, she was attracted to me and she was going to say yes regardless, but it certainly didn't hurt that we had done this exercise beforehand if I needed a little bit of help with her saying yes. So returning now to this idea of test anxiety, I have here a slide that talks about the three C's of cognitive therapy, identifying the thought that came before the emotion, reflecting on how accurate and useful that thought is, and then changing the thought to a more accurate or helpful one as needed. So for example, if you're preparing for a test, about to take a test during the testing process, um, if you can, uh, if you have thoughts about the test being a threat, and indeed sometimes this leads to what we call catastrophizing, where you say, if I don't pass this test, then I may fail the course. And if I fail the course, I may have to drop out of college. And if I have to drop out of college, I won't be able to get a job. If I won't get a job, I won't make any money, and so on and so on. That kind of catastrophizing will really lead to a lot of um, kind of physiological arousal and energy that, that, that won't be helpful, that won't keep you in an optimal range of functioning. However, if you can say, you know what, this is a challenge. I'm excited about the opportunity to show what I've learned. You'll be more likely to keep your physiological arousal level in that optimal uh, range of functioning. I think it's also very important to explore the role that uh, various cultural influences have on people's experiences of test anxiety. So things like gender, things like race, all can potentially have an impact on one's susceptibility to test anxiety. Uh, the good news is, is there's uh, research that helps us understand how this works and also uh, what to do about it. There's a concept that's referred to as stereotype threat. And stereotype threat is the phenomenon in which people are concerned that they will conform to a stereotype or that their performance does conform to that stereotype, especially in instances in which their stereotype is brought to their conscious awareness. An example was a research study done with participants who identified as both Asian and female. And they, they were randomly assigned into two different groups. And one group, was primed to think about the stereotype that people identifying as Asian may perform better on math tests. 
and the other group was trying to think about the stereotype that people identifying as female may perform worse on math tests. And guess what happened? The group that was primed to think about the stereotype that people identifying as Asian may perform better did do better than the group primed to think about the stereotype that females, people identifying as female, may perform worse. So what can we do about this? The good news is there's some straightforward ways to successfully combat the effects of stereotype threat. For example, if one makes self affirmations, for example, uh, listing positive personal, personal qualities about themselves before the threat occurs, that's a very successful way to combat the effect of stereotype threat. We know that for university students, a lot of their sort of identity and you know, sense of self-worth even can sometimes be uh, tied up into their academic performance. And that means that if they have a failed test and they have sort of internal uh, beliefs about being worthless or stupid, that can quickly lead down a spiral towards things like clinical depression. However, if their internal beliefs are such that they say to themselves that they're smart and that perhaps they didn't do well in this particular exam, but they can do better in the future, that will have, uh, uh, have a protective uh, sort of serve as a protective factor and guard against sort of uh, clinical things like depression. I think it's also important to address the idea of sort of test preparation as a, as a process. And um, a lot of things go into this. You know, we've talked about a few things thus far, but really there's a whole range of things that are kind of counterproductive in terms of test pre preparation and also things that are productive in terms of test preparation. So let's explore those a little bit further. As I mentioned before, a key is really your thought processes, right? If you can have um, sort of good, healthy thought processes around tests, then you'll be less likely to experience test anxiety. However, there are certain things that are going to impact your ability to have healthier thought processes. So as you see, as this sort of picture depicts, if the person is sleep deprived, if they're using too much caffeine, um, they will not be in a good psychological state in order to have healthy thoughts. You know, it's, it's not necessarily easy to control your thoughts, and it certainly is much more challenging when you're sleep deprived, when you're over caffeinated. However, if you've taken good care of yourself, if you've gotten good sleep consistently, if you've eaten healthy foods consistently, if you've exercised consistently, if you've practiced other self-care activities like meditation, or as you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner here, he's doing biofeedback, um, these sorts of things will put you in a good psychological state so that when the test time comes, you'll be able to have better sort of control over your thought processes and make sure that they're healthy and um, productive, and that will really guard against uh, symptoms of test anxiety. I also want to share with you a to-do list of very uh, specific um, concrete things to do to help with test anxiety. Um, so first, uh, if you're going to need to meet with your professor, you should do this at least a week prior to the test. If you end up trying to scramble last minute and schedule a time to meet with your professor, um, besides them not being um, as available as they might earlier, it also just in and of itself can raise your anxiety, kind of needed, needing to worry about that being scheduled and, and, and are you going to get that scheduled in time and, and all of that. If you do that ahead of the time, like I said, it'll be more likely that your professor will be available and it also will allow for a more relaxed meeting um, and scheduling process for you. Also, you should study in an environment that's most like the test taking environment as possible. There's actually um, in the research a phenomenon called state dependent learning. And essentially, this is just the fact that um, you'll be able to retrieve the information most if it was studied and kind of encoded in an environment that's most similar. And really kind of this has been replicated in terms of, you know, um, all sorts of aspects about your, your, your psychological state at the time, even things like um, not just location, but even smell and um, uh, whether you're um, hungry or not, or whether you have a certain emotion or not. So you won't be able to necessarily control all of those variables, but at least try to uh, control as many of them as possible. So if you're going to be sitting in a desk when you take your exam, then you should study sitting in a desk, not laying in your bed, for example. You should also get a good uh, 
good night's sleep every night for at least a week before the test. Ideally, this will be a habit that you will just kind of have um, sort of continuously, but at the very least, you want to not you want to get a good night's sleep for like I said at least a week prior, not just a day or two prior, but really at least a week. Like I said hopefully more, but you know at least a week if not more. Also, the same thing with nutrition. Again, hopefully this is something that's already um, established, kind of as a long uh, an ongoing habit. But again, you know it's not enough just to do something the day ahead of time or a couple days ahead of time. Really aim for at least a week if possible. You should also ideally relax the day before the test. If you haven't already learned the material, um, it, there's not a lot of research evidence to suggest that you'd be able to cram stuff in in the final hours. So really, there should be almost no or minimal studying that day before. Instead, just sort of allow yourself to do something that you're going to find relaxing. You should also be familiar with the test location and ensure you can arrive on time without rushing. If it's somewhere on campus that you've never been before, um, and you find yourself rushing the day of not to be late, that will already put you in a heightened sort of state of physiological arousal and anxiety that can then sort of easily morph into test anxiety. So make sure you know um, where the test is and you know how to get there easily without needing to rush. You should also set an alarm um, on your phone and even maybe if you have some other kind of backup device, you can set a second alarm. You know, for example, if your test is in the morning, you want to be able to not worry about sleeping in past your alarm. That could kind of disrupt the quality of your sleep that night. But if you have two alarms set, then that should be hopefully reassuring and allow you to sleep without worrying that you're going to oversleep your test, for example. Also, a good meal or snack before the test. So if your test is in the morning, certainly eat a, eat a good, um, healthy, nutritious breakfast. Or if it's later in the day, make sure that you carry some kind of snack with you so that you'll um, you know, have plenty of of glucose um, you know, for your brain to use for energy during the test. Also having good posture during the test. We know that our body language kind of communicates to others, but also can really in certain ways communicate with ourselves as well. So if you're kind of, your body language is indicative of someone who's anxious, that can kind of fuel your anxiety. But if your posture is indicative of someone who is uh, relaxed and confident, uh, that will certainly help. So I hope this presentation has offered you some new perspectives on test anxiety. I think a key take home point would be this idea that if you view the test as a threat, you'll get into this sort of power struggle. And um, unfortunately, that will oftentimes lead to sort of an over um, uh, 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 an excessive amount of physiological arousal that will not have you in an optimal state of functioning. However, if you can view the test as a challenge, and say kind of self-affirming things to yourself um, throughout your test preparation during the test. And indeed, even if you get a result that is not to your liking, if you know looking forward, you have a healthier thought process in terms of um, it being a challenge and something that you're excited about and motivated by, as opposed to something that's truly threatening to you, um, I think that will go a long way in your process of um, having less test anxiety and more kind of um, excitement and joy about the learning process and being able to show what you've learned. In closing, I want to share with you the uh, phone number and the, uh, the link for the website for the Counseling Center. Um, we certainly have counselors available who would love to uh, talk to you about any concerns you might have and to help you um, identify other resources that could be helpful with you in terms of uh, test anxiety or really any concern you may have. So um, like I said, please feel free to reach out to us. We are always available and happy to help.